Hey everyone, I just wanted to take the time today to react to this video, as it's typically one of the first, and possibly only, exposures most people have to the King James Bible, rather than hearing both sides of the issue. We have a lot to react to, so I'm just going to get started. We'll be giving away free books this week, so make sure to watch to the end for details. I love the King James Version. I love the King James Version because it's beautiful, because it's uh, been a translation of the Bible that has edified uh, millions of English-speaking Christians around the world. My children go to a school where they're required to memorize verses in the King James Version. When I uh, think of Psalm 23, I can't think of it with a modern translation. I have to say, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Now, having said all that, and everything this man says afterward will completely contradict everything in this opening statement. As Romans 16 verse 18 says, For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Before you write off the King James Bible completely, let me just read you Proverbs 18 verse 13, where it says, He that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. So, just give me a moment and let me try to explain. That the King James is a great translation to read, to use, to enjoy. Um, is it the best translation? And, and maybe even more than that, can we say that other translations are bad and misleading? We, we cannot say that, and we should not say that. And that's one thing to say, I prefer the King James Version. It's another thing to insist that it's the best, or to denigrate other translations. Things that are different are not the same. Either they are saying the same thing, or they are not saying the same thing. We live by every word of God. This cannot be changed every couple years or so. Like, 220 different English translations within 150 years. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the arguments people make in arguing the King James is the best translation. This is a very short video, so I'm going to recommend a book to you if you want to look at this in more detail. There's a really good book on this by James White called The King James Only Controversy. So you can buy that on Amazon or somewhere else. The King James Only Controversy by James White is a great book to look at this in more detail. In other words... Here's a book that will completely squash your faith in an authority that challenges the scribes and Pharisees. The King James Only Controversy by James White is not a balanced representation of the argument. As James White is notorious for speaking in half-truths, using a billion different points a minute without any structure or chance to respond, and completely disregarding evidence that supports the authorized version. As with this point in his book about 1 John 5 verse 7, which we will be discussing in this video. It was recommended by Norman Geisler, as quoted on the front cover of his book. Geisler trained at Loyola University in Chicago, which is where he received his PhD in philosophy, which Colossians 2 verse 8 specifically warns about, and is named after Ignatius de Loyola, founder of the Jesuits. This counter-reformation order throughout its history is a Catholic order that used and uses military and infiltration tactics to bring all under submission unto the Vatican. Most of the footnotes of White's book are not even additional sources. They're just his extra thoughts that he could have put in the text. Right in the beginning of his book, he uses a phrase in Latin, which initially in his first publication included an occult symbol called the Triqueta that was used by Satanist Aleister Crowley for his sex magic rituals back in the early 20th century. And it also made its way onto the New King James Version when that first came out, which White uses as his symbol for the Trinity on the cover of his book, The Forgotten Trinity. Which if something like the Trinity is so important, why would it get forgotten? Also, in James White's first publication, he featured a quote on the back of his book by Father Michel Paqua, who is a member of the Society of Jesus, which is the Jesuits. Also, James White in his second publication just, you know, decided to scrap the whole triqueta symbol and just replace it with an ominous triangular symbol. Kind of like the Mason's Eye of Providence, but... I'm sure that's just a coincidence. The Latin says, Recte umbilumus ad veritum evangeli, which loosely translates to, right travel to the true gospel? Which all this emphasis on the Greek makes a person wonder why would he choose to open his book in Latin? Let alone, don't we have the gospel? People like the guy in this video will tell you about White's book, but will never tell you about other responses like the book written by Peter Ruckman, 
the scholarship only controversy. Can you trust the professional liars? Their main goal is to tear down your faith in something other than themselves. Because the love of money is the root of all evil. Okay, one of the arguments that King James only will make is they'll say, hey, look, look, the NIV or the ESV, look, they remove verses from the Bible. And they'll, for someone who's not familiar with this, they'll, someone will come and be like, yeah, there's a number 11, and then there's a number 13. They've, they've removed a verse. The modern translation has removed a verse from the Bible. Well, first, we need to remember that the versification system we have was, was not present until 1551, when a Parisian printer named Robert Astian added those verses um, to a dialect version he had. The first English Bible to have versification was the Geneva version in 1560. If the verse numbering system would cause this confusion... Why don't they create a new verse numbering system? Who said we need to keep it? I thought the numbering system was not quotations inspired. The new versions need to use the King James Version numbering system as they are also always comparing themselves to the authorized version. Just read the prefaces of the ESV, NRSV, NKJV, NASB, and CEB. To compare new versions to the KJV is accurate as new versions do it all the time, which makes a person question why the King James is considered so offensive to these people. Also, he calls him Robert Eastian and fails to mention that his Latin name was Roberta Stephanus. If you knew this, and he provided more information, you would know that this is the same Stephanus that published his own Greek text that was also used for the King James translation. But they would never tell you that, because they need you to believe that the King James translators were only relying on Erasmus. But a more important question is, what is the basis for comparison, right? If the King James only is the basis for comparison, yes, then this translation has, has removed a verse from the Bible. But really, the basis for comparison, I think we can all agree, are the words of the inspired apostles. So Watch this man lie to your face. He says this as though he knows what the inspired apostles wrote, without seeing them write it for himself. And yet, he knows more than you do that we don't have the original autographs, which they claim are the only thing that was inspired as this is also justification for the production of new Bible versions without consequence. At least here on this earth. Can't say the same thing about the judgment warned about in Revelation 22. This is what new version committees will say as justification for sin, as they have what is called an evolutionary fixation, that translations along with everything else will get better over time, which goes against every age in the Bible. And by Bible, this time I mean any version. Matthew write those words, or did Mark write those words, or did Paul write those words? And then whatever translation we have, we want it to reflect the wording of the inspired apostle. Also, were the apostles inspired, or were the words that they wrote inspired? 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God, not the quotations inspired apostles. They were sinners, in which Christ had to die for, and chose them specifically to write his New Testament. They were not inspired, but their writings through the Holy Ghost are, which I say in present tense, unlike these seminary people. It's not uh, necessarily a 1611 version unless it, all, it accurately represents that wording. That quotation's Wording should not be changing every eight months, and from 1881 with the revised version of Westcott and Hort, more on those guys later, and today, over 220 English translations have come out. That's more than one a year. New versions cannot have a consistent and accurate word-for-word -word reading because they rely on a copyright that allows them to charge for royalties if someone uses 500 or more verses from their version. So they have to be 10% different than other versions on the market. The King James Version has a copyright under the Crown of England but that is a copyright for reproduction of the same text so that it doesn't get altered. Preservation, not for profits. I could print King James versions all I want and never get in trouble, as long as I don't tamper with the words. 
There are other significant reasons why the new versions will never amount to anything authoritative, which we will get to. Someone may say, well, well how, how is it that those words got in there if, if Matthew didn't write them? But He keeps saying, Matthew didn't write them. So I need to trust this man invented a time machine and saw him write it. When we go to the manuscript evidence and look at some of these verses, we can see that it does support what is contained within the King James Version. One of these examples is Matthew 23 verse 14, where it says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. It is contained in ancient manuscripts like the Codex's 10th centuries S and V, 9th centuries F, G, H, K, M, and Y, 8th centuries E, 6th centuries O, and the 4th century manuscript W. These are not the only codexes used for that verse let alone the other manuscripts that do contain it. They, New Version Translators, are relying on the two codexes, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, for this verse. People who study the transmission of the early text, there, there are certain scribal tendencies, and one of them is if it's a parallel passage in the Gospels and the scribes are very familiar with it, and, and it has some wording in Luke maybe that, that Matthew didn't originally have, there's a tendency to provide that, to provide exact harmonization between them. Would he consider that direct harmonization being things like the ending of Mark? I'm going to just stop right here for a moment. I, I don't know if you can see that. Like You, you see in the, the manuscripts, it's like, it's slightly faded in a certain section, like as if somebody scratched it out or removed it or whatever. Uh, yeah, that's the ending of Mark. This is why the end of your Bibles, your new version Bibles, for the ending of Mark, have com have said it's like, oh, the oldest and best manuscripts don't include Mark. That's what they're talking about. I don't know if that bothers you that it was there and now it's not there, but it's supposed to be there even in their manuscripts. And you're supposed to trust these people. Also, I didn't even know that Sinaiticus had removed it. I thought it was just Vaticanus. That's typically the first shot that I see of this. But apparently, Sinaiticus also removed the ending of Mark. Like, actually scratched it, like, erased it out of the ending of Mark. I mean, the Gospels tell the ministry of Jesus four identical times. That's part of the reason for the accuracy of the accounts of Jesus' life. So we have these tendencies showing up um, in some manuscripts, which this made, made its way into the King James Version. Where is the evidence that the scribes added to the text? As it is also the inclination of modern scholars to remove from the text, as clearly demonstrated with our last example. Why do they just assume scribes did the same thing over the years? We can turn to examples such as Irenaeus's Against Heresies, 3rd book, 12th chapter, where he says about the Gnostics in his day, Wherefore Marcion, a prominent Gnostic that believed Jesus and the Father were two separate gods, and his followers have betaken themselves to mutilating the scriptures, not acknowledging some books at all, and curtailing the Gospels according to Luke and the Epistles of Paul. They assert that these are alone authentic, which they themselves have shortened. If you trust these people, the scribes, Pharisees, and Sadducees, in their claim that the scripture was extended, then you would also have to trust that they were shortened. In that case, where is your final authority? What are you going to place your faith in? Scholarship or Thus saith the Lord. Consider King Jehoiakim in Jeremiah 36 verse 23, where the man literally cut out passages he didn't like, despite the manuscript evidence that was presented to him. In this case, the original autograph of Jeremiah the prophet. 
the king was thrown off the city walls as it was being sieged by Babylonian forces because he was so evil. That's probably why new versions changed 2 Corinthians 2 verse 17. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God to peddle the word of God. Although this just exposes them as hypocrites. But really the ultimate question for us is, did Matthew write it? Did Paul write it? And then we want it in our Bibles. Let's talk about a specific example to help, to help illustrate some of this. So in 1 John chapter 5, it describes Jesus as the one who came through the water and the blood, which I think is a reference to his baptism and his death and resurrection. People debate this. But then it goes on to say there are three that testify, the spirit, the water, and the blood. Now, in some later manuscripts, there's an entire book about the evidence for 1 John 5 verse 7 called The Historical Defense for 1 John 5 verses 7 to 8 by Michael Maynard. Also, try reading 1 John 5 with the verse and without the verse. It is apparent that something is missing, as it talks about the record of God being greater than man, in which the Johannian comma, which the verse is also referred to as, is about the record of God in comparison with the witness of the water, the spirit, and the blood, which is most likely talking about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Um, in Latin, and then even much later in Greek, there are, there are additional words that, that are in there. I'm reading here from a footnote in a modern translation. It says in the Vulgate, it also adds, this is the Latin translation, uh, testify in heaven the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one, and there are three that testify on earth. And, and it has a note here, this, these words are not found in any Greek manuscript before the 14th century. So, and they just lied to your face. Minuscule 221, 10th century, Minuscule 635, 11th century, Minuscule 177, 11th century, Lectionary 60, 11th century, Minuscule 365, 11th to 12th century, Minuscule 110, 12th century, and Codex Regis, or Minuscule 88, 12th century, are all Greek manuscripts before the 14th century. Should we attribute this to ignorance? He doesn't know what he's talking about. Or maliciousness? He knew he just lied to your face. This guy's a man just like anyone else. But once again, what is your final authority? Only 12 of the 480 Greek manuscripts that contain 1 John 5 are before the 10th century. That's not even containing manuscripts that could have had verses 7 and 8. It should be noted that other scholars, such as Edward Hills, who graduated cum laude at Yale University, THD Westminster Theological Seminary, THM Columbia Technical Seminary, and a PhD in New Testament textual criticism at Harvard, have expressed the need for the King James reading in the Greek because grammatically it wouldn't make sense to exclude it within the Greek sentence structure. It was not just in the Latin Vulgate, it was also in the Old Latin, which is from the 4th century. The Old Syriac, the 2nd century, the Waldensian Bibles, which predates the Catholic Church, which gets into that whole Catholic dominance thing again, and Cyprian wrote about it in the 3rd century, saying, The Lord says, I and the Father are one, and again it is written of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. On the Unity of the Church, Treaties 1, verse 6. Which begs to question, where else was it written? Also, figures like John Kelvin have even stated, the whole of this verse has been by some omitted. Jerome thinks that this happened through design rather than through mistake, and that indeed only on the part of the Latins. But as even the Greek copies do not agree, I dare not assert anything on the subject. Since, however, the passage flows better when this clause is added, and as I see that it is found in the best and most approved copies, 
I am inclined to receive it as the true reading. It truly does seem as though this verse was quite common, and although I wouldn't want to attribute motive for removing the verse, perhaps there is a reason why more evidence has not been brought to the light. If John Kelvin saw that the best copies contained 1 John 5 verse 7 in his day, and only some not containing it as quoted, almost 500 years ago, who's to say that there were not way more Greek copies that contained the comma? Manuscripts don't get better over time. They get damaged. And with such examples as the ending of Mark in Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, which is a smoking gun for obscuring and removing evidence, Who's to say that there's not a motive to remove this? This is by no means an exhaustive list of the evidence that supports this verse, as there are many specific manuscripts that include it and dozens of quotations as well. But this channel will one day be posting a video on what is known as the notorious Johannian comma. I mean, we have a huge amount of time where these, these words are not found in any Greek manuscript. And then they're written in the margin because they're known from a Latin translation. I think there's only one Greek manuscript, handwritten manuscript that's found in. And he just lied again. And some people think it was produced for the purpose of pressuring Erasmus to include these words in his Greek New Testament. Because he said, if you show me one Greek manuscript, I will include them. And someone came up with a Greek manuscript. Someone came up with it. Subtle. Just like Genesis 3 verse 1. So he added the man, I think, to his third, the third edition, 1522, of his Greek New Testament. He added it to his third edition. At least he didn't add it to his 28th edition, in which I'm talking about the Vatican-supervised Nestle Alon, soon to be in its 29th edition, which is the Greek texts that underline the new Bible translations. So the, these, are, these are words that were translated and are now found in, in the King James Version. But there's no doubt the manuscript tradition is overwhelming and vast that John did not write these words. And if I was only listening to this guy, who we can now say is either lying or is ignorant, or James White, I'm sure you could leave it at that. But if you don't get to hear the other side because you've ostracized or kicked out the person who says there should be one version of God's word, that is authoritative and accessible. Rather than just relying on an entire group of people, Jesus had an entire chapter calling out for being wicked. Matthew 23, unless that also was a quotation's mistranslation. If that is the case, then I guess you'll never be able to hear whether or not John did write those words. So what should we do? He said, well, I, you know, I memorized that verse when I was a kid, or I, you know, I know that from, well, well, well again, it's what's our, our standard, is it? That is an excellent question. What is our standard? You could argue that's the whole point of being King James only, is because that actually gives us a standard rather than whatever the scribes come up with in a new version. I could come up with a new version tomorrow and go through 15 different meanings of any Greek word and say, this is what the inspired apostles wrote. These people don't believe they have the words that the apostles wrote, let alone what God wrote. Neither do they believe you can have them either. They don't want you to go to a Bible that you grew up with or a Bible you can believe in because they want to be in charge of what you believe in and tell you on any given Sunday what to believe in. They want this rather than having you believe you have the word of God in your own language, cutting them out as the middleman and going straight to our only mediator, Jesus Christ. The Bible that we grew up with, is it, or is it again, is it the words that the apostle wrote? And we have to admit, though it might at points, you say, oh, you know, I'm familiar with that text. I don't like them cutting that text out. The question is, is, that, is, it, is it cutting that text out to, to not have it in the modern translation, or is it returning to a more reliable basis? Their reliable basis is themselves. 
for that text. A second argument that some KJV onlyists will make is that they'll attack the character of the trans translators of modern versions. So they'll say, well, this guy worked on this modern translation, and here's something he said later in life, or here's something he did later in life. And so this translation is, is corrupt. Certainly, we, the scripture is the judge of our, our lives and character. Two things. One, you can't be judging on what the scripture says if you keep changing what the scripture says let alone never believing that we have the scriptures to begin with. Second, why can't we look at the people involved in a translation? The whole naturalistic modern textual theory was established by two apostates named Brooke Foss Westcott and John Anthony Hort. They established that the two manuscripts, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, were the initial determining factors for these removals, i.e. ending of Mark, and so on. The two manuscripts disagree with each other 3,000 times in the Gospels alone. The manuscripts only became available in the same decade that they made their rendition of the New Testament in the original Greek, a title that new version committees today would call an outright lie. With their hatred of the traditional received text being apparent and even unexplainable, if we look at Westcott and Hort, we can see clearly that these men were not saved. There's just no way these men were born again. Hort didn't believe in Christ's atonement for sin, didn't believe the creation account was real, as he subscribed to evolution, did not believe in the final authority of scripture, and hated the Protestant Reformation. Westcott didn't believe in any miracles, even in the Bible, denied the exclusivity of Christ, and worshipped Mary. They also both belonged to a secret society called the Ghostly Guild, which practiced occultism. I'm going to stop there for a moment on these two men and their influence that form the basis for all new versions, and I'm going to ask you a random question. Would you marry a Catholic? If that answer is no, then why would you be comfortable in getting a Bible from the Vatican? Which Vaticanus, the second half of the foundation of modern textual criticism is called the Book of the Vatican. Luke 6 verse 43 says, For a good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, neither doth a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. The Bible also says in 2 Corinthians 6 verse 14, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? In knowing the utter disregard Catholicism has for the Bible, why would I accept versions of the Bible that come from them? Um, but uh, someone can be a very good translator and also have a moral failure later in their lives. And if you apply that same principle to the translators of the King James Version, it also, I believe, would fail, especially if you look at King James himself, who was involved in the translation. I've never heard that King James was a translator. This is the first time I'm hearing that. I know that he received an education in Greek when he was younger, but I haven't seen a source that has said that other than this guy. If he was, though, that'd be pretty cool. And yes, I just verified it. He wasn't a member of the translation committee. That's a lie. Again. People have tried to say that King James was a closeted homosexual, which came out 25 years after his death by a man named Anthony Weldon that had political and personal reasons to attack his character. This differs significantly from men like Westcott and Hort, whose children published their own letters in the book called Life and Letters of Fenton John Anthony Hort, published in 1892. If motives for verse changes can be found, like the NIV chairman of the Old Testament Bible Translation Committee, Dr. Martin Woodstra, being a part of an organization called Evangelicals Concerned, a gay Christian club, which is an oxymoron, and another Old Testament literary critic for the NIV, Virginia Mellencott, being an open lesbian, 
and then completely removing sodomite within their translation and replacing it with shrine prostitute in Deuteronomy 23 verse 17 as an example, then should that not be a concern? Or let's take it back even to the apostles. You know, we took it, let's take certain snapshots of Peter's life and say, should this guy be allowed to write a book of the Bible because of this moral failure or this inconsistency? So I don't think that that, can, that standard can consistently stand up. Another criticism, um, maybe really the fundamental one that uh, King James' only person will have of modern translations is that if they understand the issues, they'll say um, these modern translations are not based on the most reliable Greek manuscripts. There's different families of Greek language manuscript traditions, and one of them is the Byzantine text tradition, and the King James is based more, more on this family of Greek manuscripts. It is known in many academic circles as Byzantine, but is otherwise known as the traditional text line. To call it Byzantine makes it sound foreign. Meanwhile, its roots come from Antioch, Syria, in which read Acts 11 verse 26, this is the first place where people were called Christians. Alexandria, Egypt does not have that same valuable foundation, especially considering everything that was called out of Egypt, i.e. Jesus, Isaac, the Hebrews from slavery, and even Joseph's bones. So one question some people may have is, well, why, why this commitment to the Byzantine text tradition, or why did the King James translators in, in 1611, why did they rely upon this? When the Greek and Hebrew Bible were sort of rediscovered, we could say during the time of the Reformation, where people went back and said, hey, you know, we've been reading the Latin translation for a thousand years, what does the, what does the Greek and Hebrew really say? When they went back to that, there was a demand for, well, we need copies of, of the Greek New Testament so we can see for ourselves. Acting as though Latin was just the language that everyone was reading and was accessible to everyone is a bad cover-up for the fact that the only people allowed access to Latin copies of Jerome's Vulgate were Catholic priests. This was so serious that people were killed if they had copies of the Bible in their own language. This used to be expected, but now there's no issue, because you can have a different version any day of the week, as though it was an ice cream flavor. The traditional text line is largely thanks to the Greek Orthodox Church and other groups. The traditional text line also makes up the overwhelming majority of manuscripts, like 6,000 plus manuscripts. Just remember that for the rest of this video. And the, copy, the copies that begin to circulate uh, were based upon the Byzantine text tradition because that's what was available uh, at that geographic place and time for those early workers in the Greek New Testament. So, And what was available to them then, and what is available to us now, is the Bible. Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 35, Mark 13, verse 31, and Luke 21, verse 33, that heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. That whole place and time sleight of hand completely negates the manuscript evidence that does support the King James and doesn't tell you which manuscripts were available to them. As they did have the readings that the new versions use, they just rejected them and completely glosses over the historical significance of finally having consistent Bibles in multiple different accessible languages that were not controlled by Catholicism. Uh, one of the most influential of these, what's considered the first published printed Greek New Testament, was Erasmus's Greek New Testament. And I don't remember the exact number of manuscripts he relied on, but it was, it was around 10 or 11. It was a small number. It was based on what he had available to him at that time and place. And it ended up, through that and through subsequent publications of the Greek New Testament, the Byzantine text tradition became sort of accepted as, as the standard. What this man doesn't tell you is that Erasmus had studied Greek years before he began his two-year project on the first edition of the Textus Receptus and had seen many other Greek manuscripts, as historians don't even contest this. He was even provided with Vaticanus, but declined it because he saw it was too random and erratic from the others. He selected the best quality manuscripts in consideration for the job. Here are the list of some of the manuscripts that Erasmus used, which do have readings that predate Jerome's Vulgate. Theodore Beza used the manuscript known as Codex Beza, which is from 400 AD. And Stephanus, who we were talking about earlier, 
who had 1 John 5 verse 7 in his versification, had in his possession Codex L, which was from the 8th century, which is considered one of the most accurate Greek texts of the Gospels. So they weren't just relying on late scribblings by Catholic scribes or something. These readings can be verified through the majority of manuscripts, but also by early Christian writings, such as Irenaeus, Tertullian, Hippolytus, Titian, and many more, including hundreds of councils throughout the centuries. Later, as more and more Greek manuscripts began to be discovered and compared, and as we now have nearly 6,000 manuscripts or portions of manuscripts, it causes us to, to rejoice in the wealth of, of manuscripts we have. And to not say, oh, these are, you know, get these away, uh, let's just let's burn all these and not stick with the ones that, that, all, that are similar to our early translations. Now, the majority of biblical scholars say, hey, this is a beautiful wealth of manuscripts. We have these manuscripts that are Byzantine, Alexandrian. The Alexandrian manuscripts came from the city of Alexandria in Egypt. The hotbed of Gnosticism, Neoplatonism, pagan philosophy, occultism, not to mention allegorical interpretation, in which we already know their affinity for shortening scriptures. The two manuscripts, Codex Aleph and B, Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, we can assume were penned by at the most two people. Although men like Constantine Van Tischendorf believed that it was Eusebius, a pupil of Origen, who was a major heretic, wrote these codexes for Emperor Constantine's 50 pagan ecumenical Bibles. This is not the case for the thousands of different believers who penned the majority of manuscripts over church history. Also, the readings that are found in the new translations are not new readings. They're just the readings that the King James translators rejected, as there are many parallel readings of the new versions and the Jesuit Dewey Reims 1610 Bible that was rushed to compete with what is now known as the authorized version. Uh, Caesarea, and we have, you know, over... 5,000, nearly 6,000 ancient Greek manuscripts or portions of manuscripts. And so we have every word of God that is, was given to the apostles preserved. It's preserved through this, this symphony of manuscripts. Those 6,000 manuscripts that he is talking about is that Byzantine line that he was knocking a few minutes earlier. If it was preserved in this symphony of manuscripts, why are they disregarded whenever we talk about the quotations Two oldest and best. Not in any one. You know, it'd be like if someone came up in court and they, you said, well, I've got a witness in court. Here's my one witness. You're like, well, that's good. But, or if I say, I've got a witness in court. I've got 6,000 witnesses. I think I would always have to listen to the 6,000 witnesses. And yet that's not what happened. One of the reasons why we have these issues today is because that is exactly what Westcott and Hort did in 1881. And what passages and verses that would be supported by this quotation's symphony of manuscripts is discredited because they're not as attractive or glamorous as Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus, which I would recommend doing your own research on these manuscripts and maybe checking out the videos that were published on this channel. I would also take the time to read a book called Neither Oldest Nor Best, by David Sorensen. I thought I would take the moment to just provide a few examples of how the majority manuscripts agree with the King James Version in a few readings in comparison to the new versions and the manuscripts that support them. Ask yourself, would a change like calling Joseph Jesus' father in Luke 2 verse 33 be an error? Yes. Joseph was not Jesus' father. Would changing Luke 23 verse 42 from the penitent thief on the cross acknowledging Jesus as Lord to not calling him Lord being an error? Yes, as acknowledging Jesus as Lord God is essential for being saved. As he said, if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. In Matthew 17, verse 20, Jesus says it was because of their unbelief that they could not cast out devils, and that with the faith as a mustard seed, nothing shall be impossible. But in the new versions, it says it's because of their little faith. Would this be an error? 
Yes, as little faith can very well be the size of a mustard seed. And to believe God didn't answer your prayers because you did not believe hard enough is not biblical. And listen to them and realize there are minor differences that, that we can compare and understand than what, what Matthew, Mark, Paul originally wrote. Those minor differences include the removal of the last part of the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6, verse 13, removing specific mentions of fasting with prayer in the New Testament, telling you to confess your sins instead of faults, as if it were to a priest, James 5, verse 16, Paul wishing his enemies to cut off their testicles rather than just casting these people out from the assembly because of their heresies, Galatians 5, verse 12, and changes 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18 about the message of the cross for Christians, which reads, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God, to being saved. Strongly implying works-based salvation and putting in the seeds of doubt of eternal security. The debate is typically on the New Testament, but some of the worst offenses come in the Old Testament, where they say in Isaiah 7 verse 14 that a woman shall conceive instead of a virgin, which is not miraculous at all getting rid of the only mention of the Son of God in Daniel 3, verse 25, saying a man named Elhanan killed Goliath in 2 Samuel 21, verse 19, which we know is David, and calling Lucifer one of the names of Christ in Isaiah 14, verse 12. I thought I would also add Micah 5 verse 2, where this is the prophecy about Jesus coming from Bethlehem, where it says, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting, which in the new versions, it changes to whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. That means that Jesus had a beginning. That means that Jesus isn't God in these new versions. These are not the only examples. You can see more on this channel's Instagram account and more examples on this channel's YouTube shorts. So the belief that the Byzantine text tradition is the most reliable is, I would argue, something based on someone's faith assertion rather than on the actual historical evidence of what manuscripts are early and how they were transmitted and the actual scribal variations between them someone's faith assertion. And this is what it comes down to. You can always be mean to go back and forth between the arguments for both sides and never be able to come to a conclusion. As 2 Timothy 3 verse 7 warns about, saying about people in the latter times that they will be ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. It really comes down to two different beliefs. Do you believe that we have the Word of God? Which the final authority for the English language comes in the form of the King James Version. Or do you believe that we might have the Word of God someday? Which means the Bibles that you are reading will never be authoritative unless that one comes along, if it does. Until then, you're sitting in the mud because you're not nearly intelligent enough to be able to find the Word of God for yourself. And looking at that, we, can, we should say God has left us a wealth of manuscript evidence that, that vastly agrees but has minor differences, and, and we should lay all those manuscripts out side by side and, and look at the evidence. And if we did, then they would be out of a job selling books. If you're going to be relying on the Alexandrian line, you have to realize that your line only represents 50 manuscripts out of that vast wealth. Beggars can't be choosers. Another argument I, I would say against arguing that King James is the best or the most reliable or everyone should use it is the fact that the English language has changed radically over 400 years. Suppose the English language has changed radically over 400 years. Why is it that there's so many people who use the King James who do not have 16th century English and vocabulary degrees? There are many educated people that specifically use the King James, but there are also many other people that have never received what is called a higher education. As for 
hundreds of years, it was a given that common people accepted the King James in spite of alternative versions being accessible. Also, is the language of the King James Version harder to read than Koine Greek? A language that has been dead for 1500 years? That doesn't make sense, as English is spoken by 1.5 billion people today. If there was a language that was going to reach the most people, it would be English. Remember 1 Corinthians 14 verse 19, where Paul says, Yet in the church I had rather speak five words with my understanding, that by my voice I might teach others also, than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. If you just give the King James Version to somebody you meet on the street, they're going to have a hard time understanding it. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 14 says, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. It also says in John 8 verse 47, That he that is of God heareth God's words. It also says in John 14 that the world does not know Christ, and that those that do love him keep his words. If it is the word of God, and some person doesn't take the time to read them because of the these, thys, thines, and thous, then that's expected from the world. Compromising what is written for coming up with something hip and cool is not an alternative. If the King James Bible is not the word of God, and the Alexandrian cult philosophy is right, don't worry about it. We can just know that God is the author of our salvation, and yet he cannot author a book. Which, that is not the position a traditional text, King James Bible believer, holds to. And uh, I once had someone argue with me, well, they could buy a dictionary. <laughs> I like how the YouTube subtitles inserts scoffs into the text. 2 Peter 3 verse 3 says, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts. Hmm. Okay, you can buy a dictionary from the, from the 1600s. Then why did he start off the video saying that he loves the King James Version? I doubt that. This The content of this video says everything else, but... Also, he admitted at the beginning of the video that he sends his kids to a school where they're made to memorize verses of the King James. If I was a new version advocate, I'd be thinking, Oh wow, this guy is a terrible father! How are they supposed to understand what is being said? If that were the case, however, why is it that when using a dictionary for the King James, you'll find that the context of the word and its definition matches our modern vocabulary? Why not do some primary research for yourself and try it out? Also, a guy like this would never settle for just one Bible, as the nuances of the Greek are just so beyond our English language. He will never hand out a Bible in faith that is perfect from cover to cover, including the cover. But a King James onlyist would. But is that really the vision we have for Bible translation? Here's a Bible, here's a dictionary of the English language in the 1600s. I hope you'll read it and look up every fifth word. Psalm 23. I can't think of it with a modern translation. I have to say, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I guess he needed a dictionary for a shepherd. A hypocrite. Also, they have proven that the King James reads at an easier grade level than most new versions. Here's the proposition for those who have not read the King James. Try it out for a month. How about you see what it does in your life? Think about the King James. No footnotes that cause you to doubt the text. Rhythmic and beautiful wording beyond our modern spiritually dead time that we live in. Holding a book in your hand that you can know that every single word of it is pure and that it's from God. And yes, easy to understand. 
I think we realize that language changes over time. That's normal. And we want a Bible that's in the, the readable, understandable language of the day, just like the Greek of the New Testament is written in the readable, understandable Greek of the first century. When they translated the, the Hebrew Old Testament and quoted it in the New Testament, they did so in readable, understandable Koine Greek. And so they've given us there sort of an implicit apostolic permission to translate the Word of God into understandable language of our day. Their implicit apostolic permission. That sounds kind of Catholic to me. I mean... I can turn to the scripture and turn to 1 Corinthians 14 verse 19 and see that we don't need to go to Greek in order to have the Bible. But to pull out of thin air without a scriptural reference just sounds like something a papist would do. You'll typically find with these debaters like James White that they never use the Bible to defend their position, especially on Bible versions. They would call this circular reasoning, which I guess if you don't have faith in what the Bible says, then I guess I wouldn't go to the Bible either, if that was the case though. The readable and understandable language of the day is not what these seminary people are teaching. They teach that all the only way to know what God said is to have a seminary education in ancient Hebrew and Greek, if even. And if your preacher is using a new version, he most likely believes the same thing. These people have never met a English, Greek, or Hebrew version that they have never placed above themselves. Yeah, final statement about the King James Version. One thing I would, I would challenge people to do, especially those maybe who are committed to the King James, is to read the preface, the translator's preface, which you can find online to the King James, the original King James Version, and you'll see that these guys didn't think they were presenting a once-for-all, this is the English translation for all time. They saw themselves as, as building on the work of others who had preceded them. Many people don't know there were there's a, a spate of English translations coming out in the 15 and 1600s, the Coverdale Bible, the Geneva Bible, the Great Bible, the Bishop's Bible. The King James translators saw themselves building upon this tradition and also providing a work that was not final, that they realized that new insights would come into the Greek and Hebrew language and, and uh, pre greater precision and expression, and so, so that's important to realize. He just listed the translations that the King James Version used in their references that represents the Byzantine traditional line that sparked the Protestant Reformation, not what the new versions are using. There were, between the years 900 to 1611, about 14 English Bibles, some of them not even completed. That's a far cry from close to 300 translations, which if there was so much accuracy and precision to these new versions, as this guy claims, what would be the need to have a NIV, NRSV, ESV, NASB, NLT, CEB, MSG, DRA, QNA, BLT, BRB, LOL, and on and on and on, when I could just believe in one version? If you want a direct quote, and probably the one that they are referring to, as the New King James used it in his preface, yet completely missed the point of this statement since they only included part of the section I'm about to read, this is from the 1611, The Translators to the Reader. Truly, good Christian reader, we never thought from the beginning that we should need to make a new translation nor yet to make a, of a bad one a good one, but to make a good one better, or out of many good ones, one principal good one, not justly to be accepted against, that hath been our endeavor, that our mark. Let me just read that last section again. Or out of many good ones, one principal good one good one, and not justly to be accepted against. That hath been our endeavor, that our mark. They weren't aiming just to make another translation, like it's a make-work project. They did see that the work that they did was authoritative. New versions, on the other hand, do not have this aim, and one should ask what is the point of having all these translations if they can't say that they're better than the last one. This is not the only quote that shows their absolute commitment and confidence to the translation. Here's a quote from the epistle dedicatory 
that should express even more that they knew what they were talking about and knew that they were standing on something solid. It says, so that if, on the one side, we shall be traduced by popish persons at home or abroad, who therefore will malign us because we are poor instruments to make God's holy truth to be yet more and more known unto the people, whom they still desire to keep in ignorance and darkness, or if, on the other side, we shall be maligned by self-conceited brethren who run their own ways and give liking unto nothing but what is framed by themselves and hammered on their own anvil, we may rest secure, supported within by the truth and innocency of a good conscience, having walked the ways of simplicity and integrity, as before the Lord, and sustained without by the powerful protection of your majesty's grace and favor, which will ever give countenance to honest and Christian endeavors against bitter censors and uncharitable imputations. That sounds like they were confident in their translation. Unlike the NIV, which in their preface says right off the bat, the work of translating the Bible is never finished. How are we supposed to have a Bible that you can believe in if that is the underlying belief of these new versions? The authorized version has stood the test of time. Meanwhile, the RV of Westcott and Hort and the ASV of the 1900s has come to naught. As the KJV has sold over a billion copies throughout its history, I'd say that's good fruit. Again, I like to read it. I've memorized portions of it. My kids have memorized portions of it. But do I think it's the most reliable? No. Then stop reading it then. Romans 14 verse 23 says, For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And 1 John 5 verse 17 says, All unrighteousness is sin. Jesus said in John 12 verse 48, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judge him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Better make sure you've got those words. Do I think it's that other translations are bad? No. He went from the King James Bible is not the most reliable to use any new version you want. And this is what it comes down to. These people don't want a Bible to shape them, but rather they want to shape it. And they want to have a smorgasbord of Bibles that they can choose from by their feelings. When I got saved, I didn't want to rely on my own will because I knew nothing good could come out of my will in my flesh. As I was starting to see that in my own life and because the Bible tells me so. I don't want a Bible that I can change at any day. I want to be held accountable by something real. And if that someone can't hand you a Bible that they believe in as authoritative, then stay away from them. Proverbs 24 verse 21 says, My son, fear thou the Lord and the King, and meddle not with them that are given to change. And excellent modern translations of the Bible. Once again... Things that are different are not the same. You cannot say that you have excellent versions, plural, if they are all saying different things and are not definitive. And they're along a spectrum of more word for word and more thought for thought. And along that spectrum, I would recommend the ESV. I'd recommend the Christian Standard Bible, the NIV, the NLT. These are all great modern translations that accurately convey the meaning of the apostles. Just not the King James. The 1611 wording is what millions of people believe in. Meanwhile, the new versions will tell you in their prefaces that their version isn't even reliable. Even the Nestle Lund text on what they're based on says exactly that. Most seminaries will tell you only the original autographs were inspired, and that you also need to study Koine Greek, which has been a dead language for over 1500 years, which defeats the purpose entirely because they have been convinced the scriptures are unreconcilable for what was originally written. Those Greek texts, like the Nestle Alond, is in its 28th edition, soon to be in its 29th. Let's count up to 29 for a second. 
1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29. The Bible shouldn't be changing this much. You wouldn't rely on someone 29 separate times to fix your car. You'd eventually fire them and get a new mechanic. The Nestle Lund is also under the supervision of the Vatican. Had a Jesuit cardinal supervise it. And this is all part of the Second Vatican II Council. Please, if you read the King James, don't back down. And if you're not convicted on a translation, then start using it today. You cannot know who Jesus is without the Bible. And if you believe otherwise, you're a mystic. Thanks for watching Honest Answers. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll be giving away three copies of the book that was mentioned in this episode. And who would have guessed that the free books they were handing out was the King James Only Controversy. Go figure. Go to the link in the description below to find out how you can enter. I wanted to end off by saying that this comes from the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. And their crest contains a classic Catholic symbol, the descending dove. If you turn to your King James Bible, it reads that the Holy Spirit descended as a dove. You were made after the similitude of God. The Holy Spirit is not a dove, and Jesus is not a cracker, like the Catholic Eucharist implies. Anyhow, thank you for your time in watching this reaction. And I do ask you guys, if you have not decided which end of the discussion you are on, pray about this. James 1 verses 5 to 6 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. I'll provide a couple of links in the description in the case that you might be interested in looking into this further. I pray the best for you all as we await the blessed hope that is the appearing of Jesus Christ our Savior. Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video.